Okay, so I see that it's 1230 and people might still be joining us, but I know there's a lot of great information that Dr. Wasowitz is going to share with us. So I wanna go ahead and get started. First, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, you should be able to um, access handouts for the session and Dr. Wasowitz's bio and all that kind of thing, as well as a conference schedule on the patent website and the link was just posted um, above by Lauren. So um, let's see, I'm reading some chats. We will, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, you don't have an option. We will figure that out then for those of you who can't um, do, if you, if you can't turn on your video or your mic, that's okay. Please just put your questions in the chat and we will um, get to those. We'd, ask, we'd like to ask you to hold on to your questions until the end of the session. We have a designated 15 minute session or so um, for questions. Um, Dr. Wasowitz will also kind of open it up throughout the session in different sections to see if there's any questions. But if you would just please kind of hold on to all your questions until the end. And um, that way we can get through lots of content and some of your questions might even be answered um, as she's going through her content. So, um, just to let you know, this session is being recorded. It's going to be 75 minutes in length. And like I said, it does include 15 minute question answer period. Um, if you'd like to tweet or share out any social media, our hashtag is hashtag patent lit 2022. And um, now with no further ado, we, I, will let, I will turn you over to Dr. Wasowitz. Thank you, Jenny, very much. And I'm really excited to have this opportunity to be here for this symposium. I'll be presenting today, the title is Teaching Reading Using a Speech-to-Print Approach, a New Twist on the Reading Rope, and I'll be getting into that in just a minute. For those of you not familiar with me, I am a speech-language pathologist by, by background training. I have devoted the last 25, 30 years of my career to working with students who have written language disorder, reading, writing, and spelling issues. Um, you can see some of my credentials up there. And for those of you who have been around the sun a few times, you might know aerobics. I'm the inventor of aerobics, as well as the lead moderator of Spell Talk. Uh, I'll talk, talk to you about that in a second. I do want to make the following financial disclosures, uh, financial interest disclosures. I am the founder and CEO of Learning by Design, which is the publisher of Spell Links products and services, um, not including this webinar, but um, because this is hosted by Patton. Um, I do receive a salary from Learning by Design and royalties based on sales of spellings, products, and services, and I do have an ownership interest in the company. With that aside, I want to invite you after today to continue the learning if you're not already on SpellTalk. SpellTalk is a free multidisciplinary professional listserv where we discuss um, current research and best practices in anything to do with reading, writing, and spelling. So please join us there for some really um, Great conversations and new research abstracts posted Monday through Friday. So today's agenda, in a nutshell, I'm gonna begin and very briefly talk about the simple view of reading and the reading rope, which I'm pretty sure is familiar to everyone, if not, well, almost everyone, if not everyone here today. So I won't be spending much time there, but then I will introduce the Language Literacy Network, which was, so you might know that the reading rope was created in 1992, later published, published in 2001. Um, I created the Language Literacy Network in 2021 to, um, well, I'll explain my reasons and, and the goal of the Language Literacy Network. But with that, I want to talk about the role of writing, spelling, which is part of writing, but writing and learning to read. I'll be talking about speech to print instruction. This is a term I know a lot of you are hearing a lot about, um, especially these days, which is great because it deserves attention. I do want to talk about what it is and what it isn't because like, anything, um, there's oftentimes confusion. So we wanna sort that all, all out and I'll talk about some research support for a speech to print approach to reading instruction. And then giving you some activities that you can use tomorrow with your students about how to put speech to print instruction into practice and just show you what it really looks like. All right, as you know, the simple view of reading um, captured the complexities of reading in a very simple, digestible form, understand, we understand that um, reading comprehension, our ability to understand written language is a product, a byproduct of decoding skills or word recognition or the ability to transform that print on a page into spoken language. And then um, taken together with 
um, our oral language comprehension skills, our ability to understand spoken language. And when we bring those two together as a product of two components, we have reading comprehension. So that's probably the quickest um, explanation or review of the simple view of reading you may have received in a while. One other key point about the simple view as put forth by Goff and Tunmer is that they view it as a, um, they view reading as a sequential process. We begin with decoding, decoding the printed word on the page. We then bring our, um, almost simultaneously, but we bring our oral language comprehension skills to the task. And with that, we have reading comprehension. Now, Scarborough's reading rope, which again was initially drawn um, in 1992 and later published in 2001 in its original form, but published, um, it unpacks the many sub skills. Because remember, the simple view of reading presents a very complex process of reading um, in a very simple manner, but uh, there are many complexities and components to each of the, the main components of word recognition and language comprehension. Dr. Scarborough in her reading rope unpacks these for reading. Now, if you've heard her speak, and I hope you do have an opportunity, she has a YouTube recorded session. Um, she talks about how she didn't even know about the simple view of reading. They were both developed around the same time, but both were based on the same body of research, the same body of literature. And so no surprise that they're reflecting the same body of literature, they reflect very much the same skills. And so her reading rope really gives the details It unpacks what is what, what do we put under decoding skills? What do we unpack when we look at oral language comprehension? And with that, she has unpacked and given us some subcomponents of word recognition and language comprehension. Okay. So again, I think everyone here, as, as I understand, the reading rope has been used as kind of a central theme for many patent symposia. Um, perhaps this one as well. I think this one as well. So I'm pretty comfortable. You're all familiar with, mostly familiar with the reading rope. I won't spend time here. Um, I will spend time talking about some differences with the language literacy network. All right, so Dr. Scarborough describes the, the reading rope as a visual metaphor for a literature review, basically capturing what we know from the literature and the research in a visual form. She calls it a um, visual metaphor, which today we call an infographic, right? It's an infographic in a nutshell is bringing together the best of data and using visual to tell the story. And so, I decided in um, last year, 2021, that we really needed to update um, and, and advance our understanding. Well, we have a, a much more advanced understanding from the reading rope. You know, no surprise when we look at the language literacy network, as I'll show you in a minute, many things are similar to the reading rope because they're based on the same body of research. Most of that research has withstood the test of time since 1992. And we have a lot of new research. So um, you'll see some similarities, but you're also going to see some significant differences. So my goals in setting out to create the Language Literacy Network was number one, to provide a more complete view of literacy. We know that literacy is not just reading, it's also writing. So a complete view of literacy as both reading and writing. I also wanted to emphasize reading and writing as language processes. Now, yes, there are many other processes at play during skilled reading and writing, attention, working memory, cognition, all kinds of things. But at its core, reading and writing is language. And so I really, in this infographic, I focused on the language, language components of comprehension and expression of language in its written form. And as I already said, I wanted to present a more current view of literacy and specifically with respect to word level and, and subword level, but word and subword level decoding and encoding. So the decoding of words, the encoding of words. So we now have a much better understanding of decoding and encoding, each one being a multilinguistic, multi-component process. So I wanted to capture that. We have a understanding of them having a shared, decoding and encoding having a shared reciprocal, going in both directions, relationship. So I wanted to capture that. We know from research that there are advantages to providing speech to print instruction. So I wanted to make sure that was reflected as well. And then I wanted to present this all in a visual format that would be um, useful to all educators to not only, well, to think about their current practices 
and to translate the existing research into practice. So, you know, it might be reflecting on your own practices and tweaking a few things or adding a few things, because again, some of, a lot of the research has stood the test of time, but we have new research that we wanna make sure we are um, encompassing as well in our instructional methods. So with that, here is the Language Literacy Network. Now, there's a lot going on here and the focus of this particular session is not on the entire infographic. We're gonna be focused on one section of it, but I want you to have um, an appreciation of the big picture, if you will. Um, we have reading on the left and writing on the right. And what you'll see in my infographic or my illustration, these circles are schematics to represent neurons and groups of neurons and neural processes and centers that are operational and, and then come together uh, through connections, neural pathways. So these lines or these wires are representing neural connections, neural pathways, what neuroscientists call neural functional connectivity of the reading and writing brain, and how all these different language processes and skills come together for skilled reading and writing. Um, put my glasses on, just to make sure I'm seeing these notes here. Um, okay, so functional connectivity, we talked about that. Uh, I also will point out some of the major differences um, when you look side by side, if you have the reading rope there. The, the major differences, while there are some differences on the reading side, the major differences are, again, the other half of the picture, um, the other half of the story, reading, writing. So writing is the other half of literacy. We have, just like with reading, we have top level processes beyond the word, and we have bottom level processes, the word and sublexical components like phonemes and syllables. They are related to one another with a very bi-directional interactive relationship between reading and writing from early on, from the beginning of instruction. So one major difference um, or another major difference between the reading rope, which is um, on the the horizontal axis in the reading rope, that's time. So over time, we see in the reading rope how different components come together. We now understand that the multi-component model of reading and writing um, tells us that these skills need to come together from the get-go, from, from day one of instruction. And so um, I would try to, my graphic designer and I try to capture that with these wires crossing top to bottom. Um, side to side uh, from, from the get-go. And again, time is not reflected on here. Okay, the connectionist model of word study, this very dynamic interplay that occurs between reading and writing, especially at the word, the lexical and sublexical levels, syllables, phonemes, onset rhyme. Um, and this one piece that I'm gonna really focus on for the rest of today is this, what we, I call the speech to print advantage. What the research is showing as we get a greater transfer of skills between encoding and decoding going in the encoding to decoding direction. And I'm gonna show you some research to support that. So you'll see that with this arrow here. Yes, if you work on decoding, there is some transfer of decoding knowledge and skills to the encoding of words, spelling of words. But if you work on encoding as kind of a gateway or a primary approach, you're still gonna do decoding, but as your entryway, gateway, you will get a much larger transfer from encoding to decoding. Now, again, I'll show you some of that research. So that's what we're gonna to focus today is on that speech to print advantage. A um, Couple more comments on the Language Literacy Network before we move on. And that is I put this, this harmony graphic to remind myself really to, to talk about, um, you know, we hear about the reading wars and one hopes they will, some will all come together in peace. Um, and I think we're, we've made great strides in that direction. Um, but the idea is that inside, you know, this language literacy network is reflecting the neural network, actually here in the right hemisphere, uh, I'm sorry, left hemisphere, the language literacy network and how it is functionally connected, functionally integrated in skilled reading and writing. All of these components, whether they're a higher level or lower level, um, you know, Whole, whole word meaning and uh, decoding skills, they're all coming together and living in peaceful harmony. So um, I wanna quote, I just read an article by Reed Lyon. He posted a response in the New York, to the New York Times, actually in the New York Times online, to the New York Times article by about Lucy Hawkins um, changing her direction. And one of his 
lines uh, when talking about this, this very false separation of upper level language skills and lower level language skills is he says it's a rather stupid and meaningless dichotomy. And I think that's just perfect and cuts right to it is that there is no dichotomy between all of these language processes and skills. In a skilled reader and writer, they are all functionally integrated. All right, so the Language Literacy Network is offered as a scholarly advancement of the reading rope, which was originally hand-drawn in 1992 and then later published in 2001. Um, it provides a more complete and current view of research and a more accurate view of language literacy learning beyond the research from 30 years ago, with the goal being to advance teacher knowledge and student outcomes, okay? So we know, you know, the reading rope is very familiar. Um, it's ubiquitous. I did a, a search the other day, reading rope, 12 million hits on the internet. Um, so it, it's very familiar and it's being widely used by schools and states to determine and evaluate educational standards and practices. And that's good, but we can do better because we have more information to add to the whole picture now. The Language Literacy Network is intended to advance our knowledge about language literacy, align our educational practices with current research and improve literacy outcomes for all students. All right, that's all I have time to really say about the Language Literacy Network. Um, I have recorded a webinar. If you go to learnmedesign.com, you could um, watch that webinar. Um, I think it's about an hour and a half and I go into great detail there. All right, today, for the rest of today, uh, and by the way, I'm gonna pause in just a minute and see if you have any questions on what I've presented so far. But where we're going next is I wanna talk about, really, I wanna focus on this section down here that I've put the blue box around uh, and really this speech to print advantage. What is speech to print instruction? How does it work? Why does it work? We don't have all the answers there, but we have some good insights into that. Um, we know it works. It, the, the whys and the hows are a little less determined, um, but that's where I wanna focus for the rest of today. So with that, uh, I'm gonna check in on my time and I have time to take maybe one or two questions on what I've already presented. If you have other questions, happy to take those at the end, um, but Jenny, if there's anything specific to content, one or two questions. I don't see anything yet. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Ashley does ask, can you share that website for the other webinar? There you go. Learningbydesign.com and look for professional development and look for that particular webinar. And I recorded it on January 19th. Okay. All righty. Anything else there, Jenny? Nope, that's it. All right. So again, we're going to be talking uh, really for the rest of the session about the speech to print advantage speech to print instruction, what it is, what it isn't, and how to do it, and why it's important too. All right, so it all begins here. Um, and as we know, we are biologically wired for oral language, but not for written language. So our brain there is wired for speaking and listening and understanding and language. But in order to develop the reading and writing brain, the network, that is only going to develop through instruction. So there is no reading writing network that we're born with. It's not innate, it develops only through instruction and the better the instruction, the better and more efficient the network is in its development and um, operation. So um, if we're wired for oral language, shouldn't reading and writing instruction begin there? Now, I want you to think about it. Um, this young boy and all children, when they're coming to kindergarten the first day of school, they have a completely developed phonological system or nearly completely developed phonological system, right? So shouldn't we begin reading and writing instruction there? And in fact, all students, if they're speaking English, have, have the English phonology system. So they all come with the same system. All right, and to help you wrap your brain around that some more, I wanna talk about the sock tour. So I want you to think about how you organize your socks in your sock tour or the materials in your teaching room or files on your computer. And I want you to think about how, and if you don't have a system of organization, that's your system of organization. So I got you covered even if you're not as organized as I am. All right, so think about while you're here with me today, if someone were to go into your sock drawer or your teaching materials or your files on your computer and they were to rearrange them and they were to create a whole new system, very organized, but different from your system. How would you 
feel? How well would you navigate that system? Um, and you know, how efficiently are you gonna get dressed in the morning if your sock drawer looked like this when you left today and you go back and it's like this, okay? Someone else came in and created a new system. Well, that's my analogy to help wrap your brain around. This young boy is, all students are coming to school with an, a phonological system, a sock drawer, a biological sock drawer already wired into their brain. Shouldn't reading and writing instruction begin there? Shouldn't we start with that biological sock drawer? Yes, and research supports that, but most instruction, traditional instruction, not only in the classroom, but in intervention begins with the letter, begins with orthography. Orthography is a man-made system. It's well-organized, relatively well-organized, okay? It's different. It's different from the biological organization of the phonological system. So we could go there, but think about how you would function and operate and how quickly you'd get dressed in the morning if someone messed with your sock drawer. So instead of going print to speech, introducing letters first and teaching sounds that go with letters, current research is supporting a speech to print approach that leverages the brain's innate biological wiring and organization for oral language, the biological sock drawer. Okay? Starting there and using that as a starting point to, as a gateway to print, to teaching. And of course, it's not just spelling, but it's reading as well. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you know, famous quote, famous book, famous author, famous quote is we read with our eyes, yes, but the starting point for reading is speech. It's spoken language that gets converted into written language. Okay. Simply defined, if we were going to give, if I were going to give the definition, simply defined speech to print refers to the process of mapping going from phoneme to grapheme to spell or encode the spoken word in written form. Okay. Very, very simply defined. It's much, much more than that. I hope by the end of session, the session today, you'll take away a better appreciation um, because it's not just about teaching spelling, and it's not just about spelling. It's about an approach to, to teaching reading, to improving both reading and writing skills. Okay. Um, so speech instruction, speech to print, I'm sorry, instruction is the gateway through which we learn how to read, we learn how to spell, and we learn how to write. It's, it's a gateway, it's an approach, it's a system, a methodology, and an organization of instruction. All right, so let's look at some of the research. And I'm gonna go quickly here, um, but I want you to understand, there's much more research. I want you to understand some, some of it uh, so you can better, um, if this is new to you, speech to print, you can better uh, appreciate it and wrap your brains around it. Okay, study done by Conrad, second grade students, one week of instruction. Um, one group of students received decoding instruction with words, another group of students received encoding spelling instruction with the same words. And after one week, she looked at how well these different groups, and it was controlled. She looked at how well these different groups could read and spell the words they were either taught to read or taught to spell. And what she found is that those who got reading instruction, they were able to decode, this is reading, they were able to decode the words that they were taught to decode with just about 100% accuracy, great. They were only able to spell those words with about 60% accuracy. And we see this all the time, right? You teach a kid how to decode, it doesn't transfer well or much to encoding. In contrast, those students who received spelling instruction were able to spell the words with nearly 100% accuracy and read those words, decode those words with 100, nearly 100% accuracy. Not only that, on those words that were used during the one week of um, instruction. So here you see, after one week, there was unequal improvement. I just described that to you. But then she looked at how well this, this practice transferred and whatever they learned during this practice transferred to novel words. And what she found was that if students received decoding instruction, there was only partial transfer of the orthographic knowledge they acquired to reading new words words that were not presented during the, the experiment. Um, whereas those who received encoding instruction demonstrated complete transfer of their orthographic knowledge and skills um, to spelling new words. So there was greater transfer, greater learning within the task, greater transfer outside through encoding instruction. 
And she writes in her article of 2008, spelling a word typically takes, so now she's gonna um, explain, you know, kind of some of the theories about why this might be. Spelling a word typically takes longer than reading a word. So there's more time on task. And it involves a motor response. I would say an extra motor response because if you're reading, you have a motor response with your, your mouth saying the sounds, right? The extra time spent on spelling or the additional motor cues, I would say and or, but or the additional motor cues may help account for the greater benefits of spelling practice. Also, the spelling practice condition may more appropriately have been labeled a spelling reading condition because it involves both reading and spelling. When you spell a word, you see it. And whether you read it back to yourself or not, ideally you have that built into the instruction, but whether you do or not, you're getting that feedback as well. Um, so when children were provided with visual feedback to correct their spelling, they may have also been reading the word. However, this occurs when children are spelling in their everyday life. They spell the word and afterward it's visible for them to read, okay? Uh, she also writes that um, although familiarity time spent practicing, time on task, the additional motor response, and the confound of spelling and reading kind of happening simultaneously, you really can't separate them, are important considerations for future research to help us identify which of those components of spelling practice are most influential to set up detailed orthographic representations, which are what allows you to automatically and correctly read and spell words. Um, from an educational perspective, the results still provide strong support for the benefit of spelling practice in addition to reading practice. No one in a, I'm not, I think other people might be, but I am not advocating in speech to print instruction to not teach decoding. You have to go in both directions. It's how you approach it. This is another study she and her colleagues did in 2018. Now, in the study I just showed you, they were using real words. Here they used uh, nonsense words because they were able to control for more factors this way, one being the, how you, know, you cannot control how often a child has seen a real word before they come into your experimental condition. Here they were able to control it. They essentially did the same task that I described. What they found was um, on or at the end of the practice, for those who got reading instruction, you know, and the students were shown the printed word and taught you know, either to read it or spell it, and they were taught, well, geal, this is a geal. So they were connecting it to meaning. We know that's critical. You have to connect the encoding and decoding of words to meaning, meaningful words. Um, what they found after this, I believe it was one week again, that the readers, the reading instruction, um, whether they got decoding instruction or spelling instruction, there was no MS means not significant. There was not a significant difference between um, whether they decoded or spelled better after decoding or after encoding, there was a trend toward um, better spelling instruction in both cases, but there, nothing here was significant. However, what they did, you know, one week is not a lot of time. What they did though, is they then took those words that during that one week, the students had mastered, they didn't master all of them, as you see right here in this data on the left, but they took the words that the students had mastered, whether it was through decoding instruction or whether it was through encoding spelling instruction. And they looked at how well their orthographic learning, how well they retained that learning just one day later, but they looked at the retention. And what they found is that um, there was a significant improvement uh, and a larger improvement, but a significant improvement for the spelling. So um, the, the amount of maintain, maintenance of learning is, um, is there with spelling as well as with reading, but you see a much greater difference um, whether they got spelling instruction versus reading instruction. All right, um, I also want to talk about the power of handwriting because as, as Conrad points out, we can't forget about this extra motoric response that now becomes a part of the, the task at hand. This study is a brain imaging study done with four-year-old students, so pre-literate students brain imaging before and after. And the treatment was one group, one treatment group was asked to either trace a letter. Another treatment group was shown a letter and asked to copy it. A third treatment group was shown a letter and asked to find it on a keyboard and there was a control group. So we had trace, copy, match. Brain imaging before and after. Now brain imaging before showed no development of the reading writing network. These are pre-literate students, haven't gone to school yet. After this experimental um, uh, period, they 
found through neuroimaging that one of these groups of students demonstrated what neuroscientists call normalization of the reading and writing network, meaning the reading and writing network here in the left hemisphere began to develop in, in the direction of where it needed to go to eventually become this fully developed. Um, and so one of these groups showed significantly more normalization. Let you think for a minute which group that might have been and tell you. After I checked, so I'm doing it on time. Yeah, we're doing great. Okay, and tell you that it was this copy group. So those students who had a copy, look at a letter that was shown to them and copy it, showed greater normalization um, of the reading writing network in the left hemisphere. And the authors hypothesized that this is likely due to greater attention. You have to attend more to copy than you do have to trace. Um, greater attention to the orthographic detail that's required. Um, just greater attention and engagement on task. And um, the motor movement is very different, of course, for the different letters versus a motor movement in keyboarding. Now, that's not to say students don't need to learn keyboarding. Hey, these days you do. Um, but Dr. Berninger, who was one of the authors here, she, if you follow her work, um, she recently retired, which is a huge loss for us, um, but uh, she's still out there and writing some papers. Uh, but anyhow, she has a, a huge body of, of literature published, research published, um, some of it behavioral, some of it neuroimaging. And she has researched and advocates very strongly that from kindergarten up to about fifth, sixth grade, our students need to be handwriting. Jury is out on cursive versus manuscript. You can argue it both ways. There doesn't seem to be clear evidence one way or the other but they have to be handwriting because that is facilitating the development of this language literacy network. Okay. And I would argue with the older students, if I'm, I, I still see students, um, my students are handwriting. I don't care if they're in eighth grade or, or high school, I'm doing instruction with them and they're handwriting. Now, if they have to write a paper, an essay, that's another thing. But if we're doing word study instruction or even at the sentence level, they are handwriting. Um, all right, so another study I wanna talk about is just the power of oral production. Because as we know, when we encode a word, we sound up the sounds that we're, that we're engaging that phonological system, right? When we're reading, if we're reading silently, there's no guarantee that there's any activation and engagement of the phonological system. Um, so this particular study speaks to the power of activating uh, through oral production, activating the phonological system. Uh, wrote study by Rosenthal and Airy, and this was fifth graders read a passage. Uh, in this passage, there were five uh, real words, but very low frequency words that these kiddos would never have seen before. Um, I had never seen them before. And uh, one group of students was told to read the passage silently. When they came to an underlined word, they were instructed to read it out loud and just check, check and see if they had ever seen that word before. Like, look at it check and then read out loud and go. That was one group. The other group was taught to do the same except not say it out loud. So read silently. If you got to this underlying word, look at it, um, check if you had seen this before, don't say it out loud, just keep reading silently. So essentially reading a passage, get to an unfamiliar word. One group is gonna say that unfamiliar word out loud. Another group is gonna just keep reading silently. Nobody got any feedback. So whether they those reading it out loud read it correctly or not, we, no feedback was provided. However, just the power of saying, activating the phonological system and saying the word out loud, um, those were the, the, the gray bars here. So reading silently is the yellow bars. Significant differences across the board. Um, these students used more of those words to retell the story, retell about what they had just read. They were able to recall definitions for those words based on the, the passage that they read, if they read the words out loud. Um, and they were able to spell those words more correctly than if, if they read them out loud than if they did it. So the power of oral production, the power of encoding, uh, not in this case, but uh, the studies all together, um, and the power of handwriting all support um, why and how spelling is a gateway to proficiency and success in literacy. And there are studies that show that encoding spelling instruction improves Spelling, well, no surprise there, decoding, I showed you one of those studies, reading fluency, vocabulary, all these other skills. So it becomes a very powerful method um, of instruction. And just keep in mind, speech to print instruction is not 
just about spelling. All right, with that, checking in on time, uh, let me go one more slide. Uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pause in just a minute and take any questions you might have. But again, speech to print instruction is not just about spelling. And in the next section, I'm gonna ask, I'm, I'm gonna present some activities um, and I'm gonna focus on some kind of common activities that many of you, maybe all of you are probably already doing. So I'm gonna talk about phoneme graphing mapping and word sorts and combining those morpheme word parts. Um, developing automaticity and word walls, which isn't an activity per se, but it's something you do. Um, I want to talk about all of those, but through the lens of speech to print. How might we modify those activities, tweak those activities to really, um, excuse me, um, pull in and leverage what we know about speech to print instruction? So I'll pause there. Jenny, check in with you and see if we have any. We do have quite a number of questions. So um, the first question is, for those who struggle with OT or fine motor, is it still important to have them write during direct instruction? It depends. Um, if they have a fine motor issue that goes beyond the formation of letters, they, they should be working with an OT. Um, they may not yet be ready for writing letters. Um, but that's actually less common. What you're more commonly going to see is students who have no fine motor issues, they just have trouble with forming letters. This, their, fine mo their quote unquote fine motor issues are related to that. Handwriting, the writing of letters. Remember letters are um, something man invented to represent spoken language. So it's a form of language in written form. So an, a handwriting, if they truly have just handwriting issues, it's now considered really more of a language disorder and it comes under that scope of intervention. And, and Dr. Berninger speaks to this quite a bit. So what, what you will find is that by integrating your encoding, this is another power of speech to print instruction. They're gonna do a lot of writing. They're gonna have lots of opportunity to develop their actual letter formation, we will support them as needed, of course. But when they're integrating letter formation with all those other components, more specifically in this case, the phonological piece, the language, it's a language skill, that through that integration, what you see is they improve quite well um, as you're moving through a word study, speech to print word study approach. So as early, as soon as you can get them to be handwriting, the better. Um, I rarely have had a student that I couldn't get going with handwriting you know, from the get-go. Um, and, and I've had students, a, a student of mine, he's in eighth grade now going to high school, but I started with him in sixth grade and had poor legibility. It was, it was simply poor letter formation. He had no other fine motor issues. We did a speech to print word study approach. I layered in the handwriting, of course, well, it's layered in already, but you know, occasionally I would call his attention to this, you know, commonly to the BD, right? The reversals or the formation. Layering that all together with the phonology component, the, of course, the orthography, meaningful words, he, he's doing great. His handwriting is fine. Certainly well with an acceptable norm. Okay, long answer to question, sorry. Next question. No, thank you. Um, question about cursive. Um, she, has, she has read that cursive can help students who are dyslexic. Is there a body of evidence that supports cursive over print? You kind of said the jury was out, but. Yeah, the jury is out. Um, there, there's good theoretical um, perspective on why you might want to use cursive. There is a more continuous flow. Um, there is more uniqueness in the motor pattern associated with the formation of each letter. So there's good theoretical grounds, um, but there is the jury is still out in terms of research, in terms of evidence. Personally, um, I have always worked using manuscript in part because my students, before we went virtual, my students were sitting on the other side of me at a desk and it was a lot easier for me to read manuscript upside down than it was for me to read cursive. Um, and I've never had any issues. So um, jury is out is the bottom line. Thank you. Here's a couple of questions that are sort of in the same on the same topic. Is there research regarding spelling using using pens and pencils versus spelling on the computer and um, drag and drop of letters or letter tiles um, related that that particular the drag and drop 
related back to the research about the writing and the spelling of words. So um, question of the importance of pen pencil versus computer or drag and drop sort of, I guess, games and things like that. Yeah, there is there is research there. So again, uh, Dr. Berninger, University of Washington, Department of Ed before she retired. Um, handwriting, whether it's pencil or pen, I use pencil with my kiddos because if they make a mistake, I want them to completely cleanly erase it. But anyhow, um, some will argue pen flows better. I like then I would go to dry erase marker. Um, anyhow, handwriting is definitely um, demonstrated to that that study I just showed you with um, the four year old who traced copy or keyboard. Um, they demonstrated more normalization, greater normalization within the brain from actual handwriting versus pressing a key on a keyboard versus even copying a letter. So yes, um, I would move as quickly away from any letter tiles, um, keyboarding as you move as quickly as you can. There's a time and a place where you might need to start there for a particular student, but don't stay for very long. Okay. Um, and then what are your thoughts on using trace, copy, and then write from memory method to learn new words based on phoneme graphemes the student has previously been taught? I'm going to talk about trace, copy, cover, close, which is a method I use, but for specific types of words. So let me come back to that. Okay. Um, also, there was a question about a spelling scope and sequence. There's not one in this, in their, in this person's school, um, uh, in their school's literacy program. Is there one you recommend? Uh, well, the spellings curriculum has a scope and sequence. You could look there. Um, you, could copy, you could reach out to me if you want to get a copy of that uh, on the learningbydesign.com website. And, uh, you know, the thing is that decoding and encoding instruction needs to be, should be taught hand in hand. So the easy way to go is if your school has a, a good scope and sequence for decoding, you can follow that for encoding. Um, you'd have to kind of evaluate the, how good your scope and sequence is for the decoding, but they really should be working hand in hand. Thank you. And then last one, what technique do you recommend for practicing letter formation? Um, that's kind of an open question. I'm not sure if I know where um, I letter formation. So <laughs> it's a lot to try to cover. Could you ask her to maybe clarify more specific what she has in mind there? Sure. Um, I, I do follow some principles of the late William Van Cleve. So if you're familiar with his, um, I implement some of those. Tall grass, short grass, and some things there. Um, but again, I'm not sure if she had a specific focus in mind. I'm asking for clarification. And when she adds that, um, maybe we can look at that at the question and answering period at the end. That would be great. And I would say with anything I do, I'm, I'm you know, I follow my students' lead. I watch what they do, and then that helps me know what I need to do to help move them forward and correct. So there's that piece as well. All right, so let's begin you know, moving forward. Let me go ahead and continue on to the next section. I do want to get into some sample activities, uh, and then we should have plenty of time for questions as well. All right, so as I already said, I wanted to look at these activities that you're probably already doing um, and, and look through the lens now of speech to print and how they might look a little different. <clears throat> so before we look at activities, uh, word study activities, encoding, decoding of words can be done with any set of words. And of course, depending on the child's grade level and, and uh, developmental level with, with their reading, writing skills. But as a rule, you really want to have pattern focused lists, whether you're decoding or encoding. These can come from your tier one curriculum. Um, and that's usually where I go. I, I oftentimes have to make some changes because they don't often stay true to a pattern uh, or they might have like in this case, too many patterns at once. So then I have to zero in on one pattern at a time. But um, tier one material is a great place to go to get some words. Uh, in the older students, a lot of my students, I don't know if I said at the beginning, I do private practice. So my students are at a variety of different schools. But oftentimes, by the time they get into fourth grade and up, they have this series as their, their vocabulary. Now, vocabulary words are great words to use for word study instruction. Um, still learning about the encoding and decoding of words with meaning. It's 
Uncoding and decoding should always be combined with meaning. And I would argue that vocabulary instruction should always be combined with decoding and encoding. So again, it's that functional connectivity and it goes back to the language literacy network. What I have to do here though, is again, you're looking for a pattern. So oftentimes these words don't have a pattern. I start to pull, you know, if I wanna focus on the if adjective suffix, I might hopefully find one other word in this list that has that suffix and then create a few more, or maybe I'll take attractive and dependable depending on my student can manage two suffixes at a time, two adjective suffixes, and then create some additional words with those suffixes. The point being is you can pull words and should pull words as best as you can from curriculum materials, because the more you can tie what you're doing to what's going on in the classroom, the better. And I love to pull words out of um, uh, content area, reading materials, science, and social studies, et cetera. All right, so words can come from anywhere. Core principles of word study instruction fall into the ones I'll be presenting to fall into four buckets, if you will. Speech to print, we've already talked about this. I'll continue to talk about it. Multilinguistic, meaning we're going to simultaneously connect sounds, letters, and meanings. We're at the word level, so we're not going beyond the word level and word study instruction. We will because we have to apply what they learn at the word level, but the word study instruction is at the word level. So it's multilinguistic, integrating phonology, orthography, morphology. It's metalinguistic. We are getting our students to become what I call linguistic problem solvers, actively learning how, uh, actively learning strategies that we explicitly teach them, actively learning how to problem solve by applying those strategies whenever they encounter an unfamiliar word, whether they're decoding or encoding, they can call upon strategies. And then finally, um, uh, making sure we are mindful of the power of statistical learning, which is weak in a lot of our struggling students, but we can do things to not to strengthen it per se, but to leverage it. So I wanna talk about that as well. Okay, um, Dr. Berninger posted on Spell Talk very recently, 2022, so within the last few months. Um, by the way, Spell Talk, again, if you're not already on there, please join. We have the major names in research on there. Um, literacy, Dr. Berninger is one of them. Dr. Motz has posted, Lene Airy, um, Tim Shanahan. So you'll hear from some major voices. Uh, and we talk about these overarching issues and evidence-based research. Anyhow, Dr. Berninger wrote that um, now that she's retired, she has recently been reviewing their, their research from the past 33 decades, decades, so 30 years, her research, her colleagues' research, as well as that of many others. And what she pulls from this body of research is a clear conclusion that we need to teach multiple units of phonology, orthography, and morphology, sounds, letters, meanings, phonology, orthography, and morphology. So that's that multilinguistic piece. And their interrelationships, again, multilinguistic, in both a spelling direction and reading direction. So speech to print, print to speech. You've got to do both. But that's talking about the speech direction because English is a morphophonemic orthography and we need to teach these interrelationships, again, multilinguistic among phonology, orthography, and morphology and how they come together into word specific spellings um, integrated with meaning, vocabulary meanings. And we need to teach all of this in developmentally appropriate ways for words of different origins, you know, different uh, word structures. We need to make sure we're covering all of them. We can't let go of it in, after the first few years. We have to follow our students through all the words they're gonna be encountering and um, create learning activities in which patterns are abstracted through statistical learning. Now, there are many things that we have to explicitly teach to our struggling students, absolutely. But we can create opportunities that will additionally um, leverage um, and allow for statistical learning to, to happen and take place. Um, so there's that. So again, that she, in, her, in her quote there and her post on Spell Talk, she really highlighted three of the four. She talked about speech to print and multilinguistic and statistical learning. The metalinguistic, well, you know, phonemic awareness is a metalinguistic skill. We know how important it is that students become aware of these different uh, linguistic components. So. Um, I'm going to take you through some sample activities, but some core principles um, that will kind of carry throughout is begin with the sound, speech to print. We're going to leverage that as the beginning direction. Um, always integrate sounds, letters, and meanings of words. That's multilinguistic piece. Now, within, within any one activity, maybe our objective, maybe our 
primary focus is more on chronology or orthography or morphology meanings, but we want to make sure we're integrating all within the same activity. And then we always want to make sure our students are writing words, again, speech to print and engaging the, that additional motor um, process. All right, with statistical learning, um, to, to leverage that, we have to make sure we're providing our students with repeated, meaningful exposures to words. So repeated, as many as we can give. Uh, a typical learner might only need one or two exposures, three maybe, to a word before it becomes an auto word. It's a site where it's, you know, they get it. Um, our students who struggle are going to need more exposures, but it's not flashcard drill exposures. It's meaningful interactions, meaning that they're attending to the phonological, orthographic, and semantic um, con constructs of that word. They're integrating them in a multilinguistic way, uh, and, and that's what we want to be doing with our instruction. Uh, some, word, some words will take longer to develop into sight words or what my colleague Janine Heron calls auto words. I love that term. Um, and so we have additional activities we can do there as well. All right, let's take a look at phoneme grapheme mapping through a speech to print approach. Well, phoneme grapheme, you're doing it in that direction is by definition speech to print, but you want to begin with the sound, integrate the sound letters and meanings and write the words. So, um, we have, if you, if you Google famous phone, fabulous phonemes, uh, it would take you to a free online tool that we've created where you will see a picture card for each of the phonemes. So for the, the phoneme P, at the beginning of pot or pan, you'll see a picture of a pan. When you click on pan, um, you'll hear P, so that you, the student, the, the parent, whoever is learning to say correctly. And by correctly, I mean, don't put the schwa in there. So it's not pa, it's pa. Okay, so um, that's important. When you're gonna be doing sounding out any word, that's very important. All right, so the first thing I might do is say to my students, okay, we are going to spell the word um, pan. <laughs> Just said pan, let's do pan. All right, so, um, and we always wanna use an I do, we do, you do approach, of course, but I'm gonna have to short cut that a bit because of time here. But what I would do is first show my student that I'm gonna want them to sound it out. P eh, n, every time a sound comes out of my mouth, I want you, my students, to, to touch one of these boxes, you can leave a little dot behind if you want. And I want you to cross off the extra boxes because we won't need them for this word, pan only has three sounds. Now, here's the word, pan. P eh, Hmm. Notice how I modeled phoneme graphing mapping for my students, and that's that simultaneous saying in the sound and mapping the letter. All right, and then I want my students, I say, okay, now I want you to look up here, and I want you to sound out the word again. Oh, and I'll use a sentence, or I might ask them to use it in a sentence, uh, depending on time and goals. If they need, if they're working on oral language expression, I definitely want them formulating sentences if I want to just establish the meaning of the word. I might use it in a sentence myself. Yeah, you, you maybe your mom or dad cook um, eggs in a pan. Um, so we, we briefly make sure we've connected it with the meaning. All right, great. So now um, students, I want you to sound it out again. And every time a sound comes out of your mouth, I'm calling attention to the fact that sounds are gonna be represented with letters. Every time, time a sound comes out of the mouth, your mouth, I want you to look up here, it's not a spelling test, I don't want you to spell the word wrong. I want you to look up here and copy the letter or letters that go with that sound. Here we go. P. Eh. Mm. Pan. Good. Now, just to show you what this might look like for another word is if we have the word have. P. Eh. Mm. Cross off all the extra boxes. There's three sounds. Okay, here's the word. I have a word for you. Eh. Mm, I have a word for you. Okay, sound it out. Use your look it up strategy. Look up here, copy the letter or letters that go with the sound coming out of your mouth. <sighs> eh, mm, and this is where they stop and they pause and they think, and I don't do a thing because I want to follow my students' lead. I want them engaged. I want them thinking. I want them problem solving. Have. Most students are going to put it here and then I'll say, yeah, you're right. That E is silent, so it can't have its own sound box. And you've already learned that mm, at the end of the word is always spelled with the letter D. Good for you. Now, if they try to put the letter E here, some of them will. Then we talk about how, well, first of all, there's no extra sounds, so you can't use another box. 
but why does it have to go here? Because it's silent, it doesn't get its own sound box. Okay, let me clear that off and let me move on to another one. Okay, so, oh, just another way you could do this. Jenny was in third grade. She had her list of spelling words and she came to see me right after school. Um, her teacher had told her to write them five times. I said, oh, no, you don't. You know, just like write them. Um, and we've all seen it. They write L, 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 E, A, E, 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 A. Nope, you're going to do, you're gonna engage sounds, letters and meanings. So first of all, I had a little print um, little stamper. So I read a word from her list, used it in a sentence, and she stamped it out. Ooh, e, mm. We did that for all the words. Then she identified um, how uh, we talked about syllables. Every syllable has a vowel sound. Well, which paw print represents the vowel sound? She colored in the vowel sounds. Um, then I showed her the written word and she did her mapping. Ooh, e, mm, putting the letters with the corresponding sounds. Um, and when she finished, we talked about, well, what sound do you hear in all these words? Leaves, I asked her to read them, leaves, needle. Oh, I hear the E sound, right, the long vowel E sound. Let's see how many ways you can spell E from these words you have. And she wrote over here, all the different ways you can spell the E sound. Oh, look, this word, it's twice, there's different spellings. So you could see how you can take any list of words and you can, and any materials, you don't need boxes, nothing magical about boxes, but you have to represent each sound with something that helps um, initially. Later, we want them just saying the sounds as they write the letters. All right, as the students move beyond the one syllable word into multisyllabic words, we need to get them doing mapping at the, we call it, we still call it um, phoneme graphing mapping, but it's really at a unit bigger than a phoneme. It's now at the syllable level. So I might have the word um, uh, robot and I have them, whoops, did I go there? Here we go. Okay, robot, robot, how many syllables are in that word? And they clap it out, robot. Oh, two beats. Now we've already talked about syllables or they're maybe they're still learning about syllables. Robot, how many syllables do you hear in that word? Or, Use this to help you check. Okay, great. So we're going to come down here. It's the second row. There are two. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to show you the word. Robot. Using a sentence. R o b a. Whoops. Except I was phoneme graphing mapping. Now I'm going to do syllable level. Sorry. Robot. Okay. So then I have my students come here and do the same thing. Look up here and say each syllable. And as each beat comes out of your mouth, I want you to put the letter or letters that go with those sounds coming out of your mouth. Robot. Great. And we talk about every syllable needs a, has a vowel sound. Every syllable has to have at least one vowel letter. Yep, there they are. Okay. Obviously, we go much slower and obviously we do more words, but I want to make sure you have an appreciation. Now, you might notice, um, well, let me take another word. What if the word is cabin? Okay. If you're using a print to speech approach, you're gonna wanna, uh, you probably are teaching your students to separate it out as this. So nobody talks like that. We don't say cab in. Try to say it out loud right now. It's really hard, cab in. Okay. In a speech to print approach, we work with the way the biological system works. We don't mess with the natural wiring of the oral language system and we leverage that. So it's cabin, cabin, well, first of all, two syllables. And when I map it, I put the letters that come, that go with the sounds as they naturally come out of my mouth. Cabin. Okay. Now, some of you are probably on the floor by now, so I will help get you back off of there. Can you erase all this? All right, let's talk about those syllables. In a speech to print approach, there is no need to teach all those rules and have your kiddos memorize rules based on letter patterns. That's that other sock drawer. It's that man-made sock drawer. Um, and while it is organized, it's not how the brain is wired. And so, and, and the research is showing you don't need to memorize letter patterns. So, um, and I might get this wrong because I don't even 
know all the different ones, but you know, it might be something like a vowel. I see a vowel consonant vowel letter. Therefore, I've memorized this rule that then VCV, I break it here and it's a long vowel sound. Instead, the research is supporting leveraging set for variability. And by the way, that doesn't even hold up here, vowel, consonant, vowel, and this isn't a long vowel sound, it's a short vowel sound. So there's some problems with it. Okay, um, set for variability is uh, something good readers do and something we can teach our not so good readers and writers to do. And that is to do what's called mispronunci mispronunciation correction flexing vowel sounds, and we also teach them how to flex syllable stress because it's the same thing. It's not about memorizing rules, it's about awareness, metalinguistics, and flexing, problem solving. Um, I'll give you an example, and that might be, uh, I spell, I, I come to this word cabin, and I maybe say it the first time I say cabin, which is probably how I would do it if I've memorized all these letter patterns and rules, cabin. We don't even go there. We teach our students to understand long versus short vowel sounds, which most students don't really know, most struggling students, and how to flex them. So if they were to read the word cabin, huh, cabin, does that ring a bell? Do you know, does that, is that a word you know? No. Well, let's flex the vowel. Let's, you said a, you said a, a, long vowel a, let's go from long to short, or from short to long. Um, and so then they would, Cabin, cabin, oh, and that rings a bell. Now, of course, the word needs to be in their lexicon for this to work, but it's a very powerful strategy and it, uh, well, it speaks to the importance of making sure you're always developing vocabulary knowledge, but um, it is a powerful strategy that can replace the tedious, time-consuming and memorization of rules that is now demonstrated as not needed. Alrighty. Um, on. Okay, begin, so you wanna begin, just to summarize, begin your instruction with orthographic mapping activities in the direction of speech to print, um, maximize your instructional minutes spent spelling words, direct students to always say words out loud during instruction and during authentic writing uh, as they write those letters on the page, make sure they're aware that those letters that they're putting on the page go with those sounds coming out of their mouth, make sure they're um, in, sequent, in sync so that there's that simultaneous engagement. Maximize the amount of time they read out loud at school. Eliminate guess and go. Every time a student guesses and goes, guess, guesses from a picture, just guesses whatever, looks at the first few letters, guesses, they've robbed themselves of one more repeated meaningful exposure to the word, which is critical for developing that word as a sight word or auto word. Um, teach the student how to pronounce unfamiliar words out loud when reading silently. That speaks to the the study I talked about and make sure that you're continuing these kinds of activities activities across grade levels. They don't stop in the early grades. All right, mindful of time and go really quickly. Word sorts are fun activities. They're great. However, if they're not done properly, not so great. Student could do this word sort, which is a very common tier one classroom curriculum word sort without ever saying the sounds out loud, the words out loud, without ever knowing what sounds are in those words without knowing the meaning of the words, it's a visual matching task for many students, especially the struggling students. So begin with the sound, integrate sounds, letters, and meanings, write the word. We introduce the sounds, cat, a, 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 a. So first let's think about sounds. Now I'm gonna read some words to you. You tell me, do you hear a or a in the word plan? I plan to go on a camping trip. And they tell me a, short, okay? We sort the words here. We're sorting by how, what vowel sound we hear are identified. Then um, once we've put all the words, if we did a, uh, another activity where we sorted a, a, so short vowel a, short vowel a, and then we had all of our a words, we can then sort them into different ways you can spell a, and your student can discover and tell you the rule. Oh, well, a is almost always spelled with the letter e. Yay, great. Now we're gonna need to practice some of these other words because they're high frequency, um, commonly used words that don't play by the rules. So we'll learn some other strategies there too. Um, but this is word sorts. We do a ton of word sorts in, in spellings in my work with students. It's just about doing them with a speech to print tweak. Okay? Um, make sure you're familiar with letter patterns and rules based on phonological structure in the speech to print world, that's important. Um, make sure initially you're doing words without prefixes, suffixes, but move into those more complex words as the students go up in grade levels. 
but never forget about the phonological piece, whether they're in kindergarten or high school, it's an integration of phonology, orthography, morphology, sounds, letters, and meanings. Same thing here, we're doing those more advanced words, begin with the sound, my students are reading the words first, they're putting them into piles, um, deciding, or columns, because now I want them to write them, so they've sorted them, they've written them into columns based on what? Well, in this case, I had them read the words out loud and identify number of syllables and writes the words in the, num in the column for number of syllables. So they're practicing reading, they're practicing thinking about the phonological structure, they're doing the handwriting, they're getting those uh, repeated meaningful exposures, a lot going on here. Here I had them do another sort, same words. This time they were sorting based on, they read the words, they're reading again, another meaningful exposure. Um, here they were sorting based on, Uh, where the syllabic stress is, vision, visible, television. So first syllable, second syllable, stress, revise, advise, divisor, and third syllable stress, super, super, or multiple syllabic stress, supervisor, television. Okay, um, and here they were sorting based on verb in the first column, noun in the second, adjective in the third. So they're learning all kinds of knowledge about words and word meanings. Again, re reading, repeating meaningful exposures, writing, spelling, sounds, thinking about it all. And then I might have them formulate sentences. I need to go see my advisor to get help with revising this paper um, before I turn it into my supervisor. So we, we use them in sentences as well. And then they identify the common letter pattern. They learn meaning, the IS means C. They learn different meanings. So if they get to a word they're not sure about, they can use their letter meaning relationship knowledge to understand the meaning of a word. Okay, automaticity. Um, all words have to become automatic, sight words, or as you knew, Dr. Heron calls them, auto words. Um, high frequency words get there more quickly because they're high frequency. We have repeated meaningful exposures with them. Lower frequency words take more time, as well as irregular patterns. They will take more time to develop into an auto word because they are irregular. So we wanna give extra attention to those. And this gets into trace, copy, cover, close. This is where I typically will use that method. Um, I will, here's a, a word, eh, does not play by the rules. So while my student has already identified or learned the rule for spelling eh and reading words that have eh spell with the letter E, there are some words they're gonna to have to develop or spend extra time to develop a robust orthographic representation so that they can automatically read and correctly spell words like friend. So I might do um, uh, trace right here and then copy and then cover and then close your eyes and write it. I think you all know that, um, but basically trace would be tracing over the letters, saying the sounds as they do it. Okay? And then they copy below saying the sounds. So it's a tweak on trace, copy, cover, close. It's a speech to print tweak. Oh, uh, where do we go? Okay. So, er, eh, d, copy, er, eh, d, trace, copy, cover. They cover what, what's there up and they do it again now from their orthographic working memory. Er, and, and then they close their eyes and do it from orthographic working memory as well as they've got some motoric memory going. Er, eh, n, so yes, I do do trace, copy, cover, close on these words that have uncommon spellings require additional repeated meaningful exposure to get that word to develop its orthographic representation in long-term memory. All right, I think I am just about at the end. Um, I want to say one last thing about word walls. Word walls have their problems because words here are, it's printed speech. The words are put in order by letters. But as we see here with letter A, letter A in this word is E, eh. letter A here is A, eh. letter A here represents the A ah sound, letter A here represents the A ah sound. So word walls are not, they are print to speech, they are not speech to print. So sound walls, phoneme walls, um, not Arctic walls. I don't have time to go in that, into that unless someone wants to ask me during Q&A, but um, phoneme walls. Students don't need to know where their tongues are, they need to know what that they're saying a phoneme, that that phoneme, you know, what is it? What's the a phoneme, like in cat? And they need to map letters to phonemes, okay? So it's a phoneme wall. And by putting up these words, so you'll see friend here. You'll see friend, yeah. No, 
uh, as in bed. Yep, there it is, Fred. So the only sound, the only words I would keep up on my sound wall are those that the student needs to look up at until they they've learned it fully, mastered it, so that they can copy it, say their sounds as they write their letters, as they copy their letters, um, because that's yet yeah, one more meaningful um, exposure, and that helps them to develop that auto word robust orthographic representation, lexical representation and long-term memory. Um, so goodbye word wall, hello O name wall, goodbye our tick speech wall. And I think that's all I have to, I think that's the end of my content so we can move to Q and A, but let me just- clean You have up. a lot of great questions out there. So um, right. we'll just get to what we can and then, um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we, we can have you again sometime. Um, but yeah, a lot of your session opened up a lot of.